Hello, good evening, and welcome to Business Focus. This is your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. My name is Park Wissia Sari. Today we have a very exciting program uh, to show to you. Let's now go for some sports of global news, global business news making headlines. And also, what's been happening on the commodities market? We'll find out what the price of gold is, the price of cocoa, and the price of oil. This is Business Focus with the award-winning Park Wissiasari. Well, let's go for the short break. Uh, when we return, I will introduce my guest to you on the program. Welcome back to Business Focus your most authoritative business and economic analysis program. As I mentioned earlier on, we're streaming live on Facebook. We're also on your DSTV channel 279. Let me quickly introduce to you my guest for today's program. He's a renowned entrepreneur and a philanthropist with a successful career uh, spanning over 30 years. He's worked across various industries, including fintech, logistics, agriculture, property development, and commerce, where he's held uh, several C-suite positions and served on the board of multiple institutions. Uh, his formative career began in the United Kingdom in 1986, uh, where he rose through the ranks to become Export Sales Director at Gordon Richmond Textiles Limited. Later, he set up a joint venture, uh, Qualitex Limited, with DCD Finance Group, PLC based in London. In recent years, he's established the KGL Group, a wholly owned Ghanaian group consisting of six subsidiaries operating in several jurisdictions in multiple sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the executive chairman of the KGL Group, which includes fintech, logistics, agriculture, property development, and commerce, Mr. Alex Stade. Sir. Good evening to you and welcome to Business Focus. Thank you very much, Alkwesi. Thanks for having me. It's a delight having you on the program. Uh, you are the recent Man of the Year. You won the uh, Amy Africa Awards last year. How does it feel like? It feels great. I, it, it's all, it always feels great to be honored. And um, I don't take it lightly. I think there are a few uh, awards like that. And the way I look at it is these awards uh, gives people like myself, the platform to showcase what we've been able to do, not for ourselves, but for the younger generation coming up. So I'm very grateful for the award and the other awards, and also for giving me the platform to become a role model, which is basically what the whole thing is about. How did you find yourself in the United Kingdom, first of all? Um, for most of us, during the military regime era, uh, went to Legon, read uh, administration at the School of Administration, now University of Ghana Business School, so completed that and thought that um, we would go outside to f either further our education or look for um, other complementary ways of doing things to come back to the country and help build the country. So uh, I belong to a generation of young people who migrated out to countries like the United Kingdom. When we got to the United Kingdom, we were probably one of the first generation of um, immigrants who went into um, professions like finance and that before then, most of those who have gone before us were doing more or less menial jobs and that. So I would say that the generation that went in the late 80s and 90s found themselves in uh, professional positions, top positions, and that uh, put countries like Ghana and Africa on the map. What inspired your entrepreneurial journey, first of all? Um, multiple factors. Growing up as a young kid, my mom, I, I, I come from a typical middle class family. My father was a headmaster at Shumota School. My mom was an educationist as well. But it was a tough time in Ghana, so my mom had to do a little bit of trading here and there to supplement the family income. So I learned those little skills from the poor old lady uh, trying to supplement like most people do, public officials do. But then again, it was an era 
of entrepreneurship in, in the country they were great entrepreneurs. I could mention a few names. Um, Ari Dakon of Mechanical Lloyd, uh, B.A. Mensa of Pioneer Tobacco, uh, Siang of Tata. Even though the country was quite tough economically, uh, the country was littered with a lot of entrepreneurs. He, great entrepreneurs. And all those great entrepreneurs that you don't see anymore. So I thought to myself, wow, I want to become one of these ones when I grow up. This is how an economy is built on the back of great ones like this. I got to the UK, it was the same thing. Looking at um, some of the companies I worked with. And some of them were very young. Like I said to you earlier on, um, Jewish entrepreneurs could see the fire in their belly. So that actually informed my decision that look, I've got to be like some of these greats, mm. uh, go back to my country and help rebuild the country. Mm. So you went to school in the UK, you completed school, you worked with a few companies. Yeah. What was that pivotal moment? How did it begin to, to want to become an entrepreneur, to start your own business? Like I said earlier, I've always wanted to become an entrepreneur. Um, and I thought I was going to work for some of the big companies. But God being so good. Yes, I did. It, it, for about 11 years. And that's one thing about entrepreneurship. Sometimes people believe that it's just starting your business. Now, I've done my apprenticeship. I have learned from the best. You've been through the mill. I've been through the mill. Risen I've through worked, the ranks. I've risen through the ranks. Um, I've worked in 20 countries at a very top level doing these things. So I was basically ready to move out on my own. Yes, it's always good to start from the scratch. From the scratch, but you also there's if the opportunity lends itself for you to learn under great entrepreneurs, which I did at some of the best, um, and the opportunities were given to me when I worked for these companies. Like I said, twenty countries earlier when I was telling you how Dubai was built and that I saw. Uh, Dubai go through all that. Not only Dubai, I worked in countries like Ireland. Uh, saw the, the violence and that. So you learn from different cultures and that built my entrepreneurial spirit. And I thought, wow, this is something that we could uh, do in Ghana. So, so what was the first initiative? I had been in textiles. So we grew the textile company in my time working for other, uh, um, other groups in textiles. Uh, it was an English company. So the UK controlled Hong Kong then, so we supply uh, Hong Kong through uh, China through Hong Kong, uh, the British controlled uh, Dubai. They actually set up the UAE. They put the Emirates together, so we would do business there. So I learned to do all these things with the company, and eventually, um, when I was ready to branch out, I, I, after working for the company at the highest level, became a, a an export sales director of the company. I decided to branch out and was supported by some of the big uh, fi 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 finance firms in the city of London. Okay, so, you know, you worked several years in the United Kingdom, you know, you, you built your craft there. What motivated you to come back to Ghana? I've always wanted to come back. I've always wanted to come back. And there are a lot of people who didn't think I'd left. Because... You still had footprints. I had footprints. I would travel to Ghana. Any company that I worked for, I made sure because when I was working for uh, Gordon Richmans, like you um, just mentioned, mm. I'll make sure that most of our businesses are done in Ghana with the DCD group. We would fund things in Ghana. So I was in Ghana about four times a year. From the 90s. Oh, we, right. From the 90s, I was mm. in Ghana about four times a year. And um, we would fund huge companies like the GNTC. I don't think the young ones know what GNTC is. GNTC was one of the largest um, conglomerates in West Africa or Africa, which was set up by Nkrumah, Ghana National Trading Corporation. And we used to fund their, their um, retail business. They used to own Coca-Cola, uh, bottling, and that. So we used to fund them. We used to fund other um, companies like Bones Brothers. We used to fund the likes of Nab Brothers and a lot of private sector uh, uh, organizations. So that brought me to Ghana about four times a year. So I thought this is somewhere that I would want to um, come back and help. And when the opportunity came to 
get back. I took you that. You grabbed it with both hands. Yes, yes, I did. With Not, both notwithstanding hands. the business climate, the, yeah. the high cost of doing business, and all the negativities that surrounded working in Africa? Yeah, I, I had a fair, because uh, I, I worked in quite a few African countries as well, the East Africa. I was in uh, Rwanda just after the war. So I've seen also Rwanda come up, Uganda, and all that. There are peculiar problems with uh, some of these countries, which my colleagues from the West, like the British colleagues, didn't want to touch. I encouraged them for us to do business in Africa. The profits were quite huge. The margins mm -hmm. were quite mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. But there is a mindset um, of the British or from the developed world that Look, the profits can be as huge as you want, but if there is a little uh, chance of default, they wouldn't want to deal with those things. But I took the risk. I took the risk. I, held, I, I, I encouraged my partners to take the risk. There were rewards. Obviously, you have a high rate of default, but because the margins were quite uh, huge, you could sort of uh, uh, make up for those ones, yes. Mm. Mm. So, the KGL Group, what inspired the formation of the KGL Group? The inspiration came from when I came down, um, wanting to replicate what we've been doing around the world. So, I said to my partners, I'm going to go back, I need your support. Uh, we've done a lot of business in Africa. We've taken a lot of money from Africa. We've funded projects. We've done all these things. You know, there's the business. I spoke to my bankers. Because sometimes they used to ask me, where, 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 where's all this money coming from in Africa? Some of the banks, I used to bank uh, with a, a bank called Midland Bank in those days, which turned out to be sold to HSBC. The bank manager would ask me, where we found money in Africa because his perception of Africa was there can be no money in Africa. There's dry land. There's a dry land. And, and that's all. Through the, the business that we were doing in Africa, I was able to convince my, my financial partners and that, that, look, there's a lot of business to be done in Africa, so I need backing. So they backed, they backed me, basically. Mm. So we came in... Um, to start KGL Group, other challenges were quite a lot and still quite a lot. Um, fortunately for us, we don't look at the challenges, we look at the challenges as opportunities. The challenges that persisted around that time uh, are not the same challenges that you have now. There was a current, you still have the currency problem, but it's always been Ghana's problem, the mm -hmm. currency, uh, depreciation of the currency and that. Most importantly, as I see now, as a diaspora who have come to settle in, it's a mindset. It's a mindset and, and, and of, of the Ghanaian, the, Afri the African. And that is what the main challenge is. How to reorient the, the mind to focus on the private sector. I always advise my colleague, the diasporans, that if you've gone out to seek not only knowledge but resources and that you must come back with those things you cannot compete with those you left behind uh, chasing the same finances that they are chasing and that so i was clear in my mind that coming back i needed to bring the finances i needed to bring the the uh, human resource at least part of the top end of that human resource to make a difference. So these were some of the ways that we overcame the, uh, the challenges. But um, we still fight on the challenges. There's the, the political landscape, which is, um, that terrain is quite tricky to navigate mm -hmm. in a country where I've come from, um, my, I still have companies in the UK and that, and they tell you that my boss is my God. Here is different. Uh, it's not he who pays your salary, but sometimes it's the government. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. People owe allegiance to political parties than they owe to the one who pays their salary, mm -hmm. 
which is the other way around in, in places like the UK. You're, the one who pays your salary is the one that you owe the allegiance to. Mm. And so you are able to build companies on the back of that. Mm. So uh, over 26 years working you know, in the private sector, KGO has now grown mm. in leaps and bounds. Mm. How many workers do you have now? Uh, about 200. About 200 in yeah. total? In total, yeah. And you've got other subsidiaries? We were subsidiaries. We work across 12 countries. We are in most African countries. Across 12 countries? We work across 12 countries, including the UAE, the UK, 12, and other African... In Africa, we do eight countries. And we're, what exactly do you do? Uh, fintech and tech. Um, we are the largest um, partners to the NLA here, and so are we to another four African countries. The same service that we provide to the National Lottery here, which is the digital, running their digital platforms, providing the technology that drives it, we do that in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we are the largest uh, also in Cote d'Ivoire. We work with the lottery um, regulator, Lonasi. We do the same in uh, Nigeria. Um, we're doing in Nigeria. In Nigeria, we do yes. So then, turn and the state of Nigeria. The, yeah, National Lottery How of Nigeria. How do you Nigeria. get these deals, Mr. Dade? How do we get these deals? Uh, it shows you that it's not political. Uh, uh, most of these are not political. They are commercial. You make a commercial case, and that's what we've made in Ghana. That's the same case because we don't know any politicians in Nigeria. Neither do we know in in a Cote d'Ivoire. In Cote d'Ivoire, I'm off to. Kenya, I, this weekend, we are setting up in Kenya. We're doing Liberia. And uh, what we're trying to do, we are in Uganda. Uh, we are doing, we are not the largest, but in Tanzania, we're doing something there. So we're all over the place. Our footprint is there. Um, and we made a commercial case to do this. We're taking advantage of AFTA also to bring all these uh, companies, um, all these countries together uh, under what we do. Uh, uh, technology and that brings project. me to my next subject of mm. public-private partnerships mm. and the importance of, of establishing that relationship. Mm. Uh, you've had governments in the past say the private sector is the engine of growth. Mm. Government, all government has to do is to provide the enabling environment mm. for the private mm. sector to thrive. What's your own position on this? I think I'll start from the point of my vision and my philosophy. My philosophy is great countries are built not by politicians, but by great entrepreneurs, by great entrepreneurs. Once we shift our mindset that we have to encourage, I hear governments all over the place talk about raising millionaires, raising billionaires. Sometimes we misunderstand this concept of raising these millionaires and billionaires. We raise them for society. We raise them to create employment. Yes, they might take a chunk of it, but would you rather government take a chunk of your money right, and provide you with nothing, or the private sector take the lead. We have a recent example is mm. Dangote in Nigeria. Mm. Yeah, sometimes you get a little bit of political backing, and that. it doesn't matter, because that's what the government is supposed to do. Government is supposed to back the private sector, be it in our country, MPP or NDC, it doesn't matter. That's the role of government. We've got it all wrong. Sometimes we create our own narrative of uh, an MPP businessman, an NDC. There's no MPP or NDC business. There's a businessman. They work because of the way we have structured our system. So they have to work with the government. Sometimes you hear of people saying, oh, uh, this one was NDC and it's moved to MPP. And uh, they have businessmen don't think like that. They do whatever is necessary. So we have to encourage the private sector, not as a lip service and say that the private sector is the engine of growth. And we don't actually uh, mean that. We don't put that into practice. If you look at, because most of these things, including taxation, including where our economy, where economy goes down and that, it's all connected to the fact that we've left the commanding heights of our economy in the hands of government. Look at the books of NLA. We wanted to do the digitalization for NLA and there was a a, a lot of um, backlash on that, coming in to take over uh, these things and that. We came in for nothing. The public-private partnership with NLA was based on one thing. What did NLA have? A brand. A brand. Simple. Their brand, without cashing in their brand, 
It's nothing. Four years before we came in, NLA had, a re had revenue of one, uh, just a, under over a billion. They managed in these four years to make losses of 45 million. They managed. They managed. I don't know how they did it, but I don't think a private sector organization will make, uh, will do revenue of a billion and come out with 45 million losses. But they did. And when we looked at the books, we thought, wow, this is, this is challenging. How can we change this round? We thought that it would be a profitable. But we came in um, to mention figures, right? They wanted us to use the brand of NLA. They wanted about 30 million cities in those days when we came, which was a lot of money. It was, it was uh, at a time where the dollar was just about five or, or so. So you can tell what 30 million was. And this is a new firm coming. It's an uncharted uh, territory. So we've come in to see what we could do. And yes, okay, we took the challenge. And you know what we did the first two months? <laughs> we did a revenue of 68,000. And we won went on. And today I'm proud to say that we, 85% of the revenue to NLE comes from us. We change it. And what do we use of NLEs? Zero, the brand, the name, the name, right? So they are, provide the infrastructure. We provide everything. They put nothing. They put zero. They put zero. When I say zero, nothing. Not only do we provide them with 85% of their revenue, we also pay on our profits, on our profit, 33%. So you can tell what the government makes from this, this public-private partnership in taxes. We, we do 25% on CIT, 8% on dividends. So you can tell who wins, right? Yes, we make money. We are there to make money. But the government is a major winner. The NLA is quiet now because um, uh, the, the, the uh, staff are paid. They get the allowances. They get everything. They sponsor a lot of uh, the, the projects in the country. The narrative has changed. This is what public-private partnership can bring. Usually, the government doesn't have, the public sector doesn't have the finances. They don't have the technology. But sometimes they have some infrastructure which they can put in the port. So we have to change our mindset. We have to let our people understand that it's creating value. When we create value. So you agree with those who say it is not the business of government to be doing business. Exactly. Exactly. They do it inefficiently. And also when I was growing up, the structure was a little bit better. People say Nkrumah set up all these things and later all these things. The appointment system into these ones, right? It was more meritorious then. Yes. And it's, it's a controversial... Uh, it is. It is a controversial thing mm. to say. Mm. But there are people who run uh, government organizations that the private sector won't employ them as in... Man middle level management mm. like there's i said too much all, patronage there's too much patronage there's not the expertise mm. and that because uh, like as when i was growing up it was by merit because mm. it, to be appointed i think it changed under uh, a military regime i wouldn't say which one mm. i changed under a military regime where all these appointments were made by the military rulers mm as opposed to the Public Services Commission where you go for interviews by merit and posted to these organizations. Mm -hmm. It's not now. And also that leads to the problem that we have in our body politics, mm -hmm. right? Because the jobs in the public, the real jobs in the public sector has been squeezed out and put in the political sector. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to be a politician. Whatever mm -hmm. you want to work, you have to be a politician. Mm -hmm. You have to be aligned to one party or the other. So you leave Legon, you're a communicator, you go on, you talk, you come in, you get some position. In our days, it wasn't like that. Do, you have to do, you, do, you, do you express yourself as openly and as sincerely like this to the politicians when you meet them? Do you tell them? I do. I do that, I do that in private, and I'll tell you why. Right? I believe that we have to also uh, we have to move from this, and most of them understand. Uh, I think both sides of the are they understand mm -hmm. that you have to move from this system. But how do you move from the system? It's a system that your followers, right? Mm -hmm. That's the patronage system. We become so accustomed to. We, we become so accustomed to. Mm -hmm. And for business people like myself, mm -hmm. we have to elevate the argument to the stage that we 
are not seen to be partisan in our pronouncement. How do you do it yourself? I mean, how do you relate to the two parties? I'm sure you've got friends scattered across. Of course, of course, mm. of course. Uh, you support one party or the other. Mm. Everyone mm. does right. Mm. Uh, I always make the point that who you give your money to is your prerogative. Mm. We do it in the UK. Mm. We do it in the US. And uh, you, you've seen Elon Musk giving a lot of money. Uh, it is prerogative. Mm. Unfortunately, I also believe that as leaders mm. and uh, uh, business leaders, we have to be circumspect in, in our pronouncements. You know the polarized system of our politics, right? So mm. if you want to build the business environment, right? Just like the press, the media, if you are seen to be making uh, pronouncements open against declaration. open declarations and that, right? It doesn't work well. It doesn't sit well. So you become part of the issue. So I don't, mm. as a rule, comment mm. publicly. I don't comment publicly. Mm. I don't articulate my private thoughts mm. publicly. Mm. But when there are national issues, like we're talking about public sector mm. and that, that I Galamse. believe, Galamse and that, those are national issues. Mm. I've got to take your, your bite on this particular subject. And it's good because you work, you know, in the IT space. Mm. Uh, you talk about how businesses are often harassed, you mm. know, over mm. issues of taxation and all mm. that. Mm. Uh, what do you make, I mean, your sincere opinions mm. on taxation within the electronic, you know, mm. money payment mm. system? as well as the tax on bets. And of course, mm -hmm. we've had the views of you know, the two political parties mm -hmm. and what they think of this. What did you make of it? I mean, somebody who... I, I, I don't only really make. I fought it. Mm -hmm. I fought it. Mm -hmm. I think we did fight it. Because... Oh, you did? Yeah, we did. We did. Because I don't think one of the reasons... Uh, we, we, uh, the, one of the reasons why some of these things haven't come up or not been implemented mm -hmm. is we challenged, not openly... But we engage the uh, GRA, mm. we engage the authorities, and uh, it's a wrong... Uh, Why uh, is it wrong? It is wrong because we are trying to promote not putting money under bed and that, right? Um, and using uh, digital means to uh, grow our economy. Mm. I believe that at one point when we have achieved that, right, we can look at, we can look at that. But at this moment... And when I give you an example of the lottery space, for example, we worked so hard to bring it to this level, right? And taxing it means that reversing the gains of it. Who's going to pay? They're going to, back to go back to illegal lottery. But we hear the flip side argument that that's why we have a sin tax. I mean, mm. this is to serve as a disincentive mm. for the youth going into betting. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. I believe that uh, they have to be uh, obviously, we don't engage in betting. Lottery tends to be national. There's a distinction between lottery and uh, betting, right? Uh, lottery tends to be national in nature. Mm. It's owned by the government. What we say is it's a voluntary taxation mm. for every economy. Um, I believe that um, there, there can be ways of uh, uh, doing that. Um, yeah, taxes is one, one of the ways of, of, of doing that. But... Um, it's not the only way of disincentivizing. Well, you're still watching Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program here on TV3. My guest on the program tonight is Mr. Alex Dade. He's a founder and group chairman of the KGL. We'll take a short break and return right now. This is Business Focus with the award-winning Park Wissiasari. Right, welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program. Uh, if you just joined us, if you just tuned in, this is our exclusive interview with the group chairman and founder of KGL, Mr. Alex Dade. You've spoken extensively on, on how you, you've over the past managed to convince uh, people within the diaspora or investors to, to come invest in Africa, or even in Ghana, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, how, what are you telling them today? Today, we're in our part of the world, mm -hmm. you know, nearly, for nearly two years, we've been priced out of the international capital markets. Mm -hmm. there's, there's been haircuts, mm -hmm. you know, depriving investors mm -hmm. of their needed investments and returns. 
What are you telling them today? Same story. Uh, I'm the chairman of GIPC, and I'm a living example. The, the economy is rebounding. It's coming back. Will it come back? Yes. By next year, I think this year, um, it will grow by about 5.5 to 6%. It will probably grow uh, 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 much higher next year. But if we don't change the way we do things, we will come back to the same thing. We'll go around. They say we've been to the IMF uh, 17 times. Is it the last time? No. We heard it uh, probably about six, seven years ago. That is the last time. So when is the last time? For us, this is our country. When I preach to the diasporans, I say one thing. And I have always maintained, and I continue to maintain, the mantra that we prefer diasporan direct investment to foreign direct investment. Unfortunately, we've dwelt when I got into GIPC. I focused on the diaspora. That's why we are diasporans. Where do we take the money? I'm not allowed to repatriate my profits because I'm Ghanaian. So my profits stay here. But if I had partners who are foreign, they're allowed to repatriate that, right? These are arguments that we have all the time. We have to encourage the economy to be left in the hands of Ghanaians, the diasporans, when they come in, because they are part of us. They have the resources. Let them come. Let us welcome them. Like, I was welcomed into the country. I've changed the narrative of a lot of things, right? And to answer your question, that what am I telling them now? I'm telling them that there's still hope here. There's still hope here. This is the country we have. Uh, most of us went out not to live there, to acquire knowledge, to acquire resources and come back. Unfortunately, also, the, the locals that we left behind don't make it easy for us to come back. Or when, when did they come? When we were doing this, where were they and all that story. So diaspora leaders like myself have to tell or, or a, a good story how both can coexist and also uh, channel uh, the resources that we bring in into productive use. Sometimes uh, we talk about remittances. We talk about remittances. The Bank of Ghana records one thing and uh, the World Bank and that records another and we know why there's that disparity between mm -hmm. the two. Um, because also the Bank of Ghana makes it very difficult for the free movement of these funds. So in my estimation, there's five, six billion. It surpasses everything that we get in. It surpasses foreign direct investment. It surpasses uh, all commodities mm. and that. Mm. So we at GIPC, made, we've made it a point to attract that. And once we've attracted it, what's the next move? The next move is to channel it, not into consumption, mobilize this and channel it into uh, productive ventures. But as board chairman of the GIPC, regrettably, it doesn't look like Ghana is, is, is still keeping its place as an attractive investment destination. I mean, if you look at the World Bank report, mm -hmm. uh, the very recent, probably in 2022 or so, mm -hmm. it looks like Ghana is losing its place. I wouldn't say Ghana is losing its place, but there is a lot of competition. Mm. And I come back to our mindset. Mm. I come back to our mindset. That there's some ridiculous laws that are passed when you look at uh, exemption laws. And it's not explained to the public. We play politics with it. I mean, in some of the companies we deal, I told you we were in Cote d'Ivoire, we were in other countries, right? They don't have those sort of laws that... If someone, 100% of zero, is zero. If someone is going to set up here and he says, look, I need... 30, 40%. Yeah, I need some exemption mm. on X, right? You work it out. Obviously, you don't want them to cheat us as well. And that. So you work it out and say, okay, come in. When do you come in, right? At GIPC, we were doing that. We were working out, and we we're working it out with a... Uh, Ministry of Finance to see the benefits that we get. So you want to come in and say, look, I've got maybe a billion to bring in, but I need tax exemption of 50 million. So work it out. What would we benefit? So the benefit for us will have to be bigger than the 50 million. So we, we, we get down to figures and work out, okay, you pay PAYE after the expiry of the exemption period, we would earn X in 
corporate tax and that, and we come up maybe a 10-year period, right? Uh, the government will benefit 200 million with your 50 million exemptions. We are up. So, so lead us, lead the way into changing these laws. I think we have, I think with the exemption law, we've taken it back to parliament, we're reforming the GIPC Act as well. And people like myself, who are private sector actors, and uh, when I was appointed chairman of GIPC, I was hailed that all oh, we're going to see change because we've got one of ours. We've got a private sector person leading GIPC. We've got a diaspora leading GIPC. So we've tried on GIPC. I serve on GIP, GIPC pro bono. That's what I give back to GIPC. Mm. I travel on my own. I don't earn per diem. I sponsor GIPC. I do whatever. Your conglomerate, I know you've got a, a foundation as well. Mm. I know you like to support young people. Mm. Uh, and entrepreneurship, obviously, is at your heart. You want yeah. to see a lot yeah. of young people grow. Mm. Does it hurt you that the cost of doing business, mm. average interest rates, are just, to, to put it bluntly, ridiculous? I mean, when you look at how much a young person has to pay just to go for, the, for a loan to start a business, mm -hmm. I mean, does it hurt you? It does, but we have to find out why. I mean, looking at it. And, so, and also, it comes to the point that that's why some of the policies don't actually work and you have to keep on increasing interest rates because they don't respond. In other countries, they do because half of the people have their money in the banks. Mm -hmm. So they do. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of people don't even bank, interest rates doesn't mean anything to them. Right. then it's hurting those ones who go and borrow. You are trying to mop up by giving higher interest rates. That's one side of it. Mop up. You want to mop up excess liquidity. Excess the liquidity market. by increasing. Mm -hmm. They don't put the money in the bank. So we're not consistent with seeing government go on the treasury bill market to borrow. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the problem. Because what you are trying to do, control inflation mm. by mopping up liquidity. Mm. The money is not in the bank, so it's not controlling inflation right. like it will in other it's countries. It's a textbook It's a textbook thing. Yeah. It's a textbook mm. thing, mm. right? And we have to sit down really with the practitioners like us and, and, and get a solution to it. Mm. You are hurting those ones who want to borrow because who pays 30% in that? You asked me a question earlier on that. Do I, uh, would I, uh, Go for would I fund mm. uh, the debt in that? Uh, no. The answer is no. Even if I wanted to, you wouldn't be in this country. <laughs> yeah, because what would you do mm. to, 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 to earn that kind of money? You're just going to, to, to default. Mm. Mm. You are set up for default. 30%? Mm. Who has that kind of margin here? Mm. So yeah. you are set up to default on your, your obligations. Mm. Um, first of all, I'm interested in your philanthropy. Mm. What exactly do you do at that foundation? Mm. And then what other businesses do you run apart from your IT business? We have, we have I think we have seven companies within the group. Uh, we have the foundation. You wanted to know about the foundation. Mm. It is my belief, it's my vision that uh, wealth creation and poverty eradication through job creation are two sides of the same coin. If you're a wealth creator, you have to also be distributing right so and also in the communities that you work in you cannot and it's a personal vision it's a philosophy mm. you cannot leave the communities in this the state that you found them you have to leave them better and that's why we set up the kgl foundation to specifically concentrate on that and we learn from other um, companies who've done that successfully we don't as a policy mix the work of the foundation with our marketing or with a group thing. So I'll give you an example. We are the largest funders of the Black Stars, right? Uh, we put a million dollars into the Black Stars, but that's under our marketing arm. We, uh, they market our shirts, they do all sorts of things uh, for us, mm -hmm. right? But we also fund the uh, GFA, through the foundation, they've put in a million dollars also over a four-year period. So you've put in a million dollars into the Black Stars. That's, that's another million dollars into yeah, the FA. Yeah, and the million dollars in the Black Stars, mm. we get back through marketing. Right. It's a marketing strategy. Right. It's a marketing strategy, mm. purely marketing. Mm. We fund the juvenile, the juvenile uh, football, which used to be called, is the GFA KGL Under-17s Tournament. That's funded as 
a charity from the foundation, we don't seek to make any marketing decisions. The foundation has its own board. They make their decisions. Independent. Independently. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, uh, I think they have, uh, we've picked our five thematic areas from the UN 17 SDGs. So we do education. We've given about 100 and all scholarships. We give every year uh, under education. Health, we do. At the moment, we fund in. And we've provided uh, 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 vehicles and that for mental institutions. We're working with the newly set up um, uh, mental health care authority. We're building under the foundation, uh, which will start the only uh, mental health unit north of uh, the country in Kumasi. We're working with Lady Julia. It's going to be a multi-million dollar facility in Kumasi. We do that. that all that under the foundation. Because it's our philosophy. 5% mm. of our profits go into the foundation. Does it hurt us? No. We do... Uh, we do, I think we fund every year about 60 grassroots charities. We have some in Nima, we have some in the north, we have Jamestown, and uh, I think the last application, they had about 500 applicants. Wow. But they'll cut it down, they'll cut it down to about 60. Mm. They give them orientation, they train them uh, how to manage these things, and we give them the funds. This is an election year, mm. uh, of course. It gets tumultuous during election years. Mm. Already we've seen what's happening in Parliament, mm. the seeming constitutional crisis between the legislature and the judiciary. But for, mm. for you as a businessman, what do elections mean to you? And how important mm. are elections to the business community? I think it's quite disruptive. We, we see it every time. Uh, because we've seen it so many times, we know that these are games that are played around between... The, the sites and that. But it's about time that we grew up from this. Sometimes you look at it and you, it reminds me of when we were in school. And I look at both sides and I look at, wow, this is student politics. It's not a game. It's real. We have 30 odd million Ghanaians who are facing dire problems for us as entrepreneurs. We are thinking about how to solve these problems. They are commercial decisions. And sometimes, we need the support of some of these. They are leaders. They are leaders. There's two months to an election. Do we have to fight in parliament? I would rather, as a businessman, be concentrating on my constituency. Does it have the perception, or the Ghana's perception, in terms of business climate, you know, seeming fears of instability, does it hurt business? I think to an extent, yes. But we, as business people, I can speak for myself, we factor in some of these things. We factor in election year. And that's why you see it's gone down a little bit. Mm. But from 1992, you could see all the foreigners, but their tickets, mm. there's a lot of... It, it creates money. a period of uncertainty. It creates so much uncertainty. Mm. And then we have a stop-start situation in Ghana. Mm. Where, who does it hurt? Mm. It hurts the ordinary person. Mm. Because it, whether it's government over shooting its mm. expenditure or is the opposition creating table, it's all that it's hurting us. By the time we get to January, we have to start. Does it, for you, I mean, does it even influence the kind of decisions you make in an election year? Where to put your money, what to do, you know, on the assumption that you, you really don't know what's going to happen next? Actually. Of course it does. Of course it does. Mm. Because... I would, I'll be honest with you. We have one company. You asked me about the companies within the mm. group. Uh, we have one company within the group, KGL Capital. Mm. What does KGL Capital uh, do? What it does is um, it's a venture capital arm of the... It's a private equity arm of the group. And it, it goes into partnership with small companies. We've invested. We just recently invested in a, a, a water-producing thing. We invest in companies that are... Uh, uh, uh. So, so what do you do to take up equity in we take up equity. private business? Yeah, we take up equity. Mm. We put in a fund of about $100 million uh, equity fund, mm. right? To fund these things, to help startups, right? To, to help companies that we believe mm. have a lot. Of, but what have we done in the last probably six months? We put everything on hold. They come to us and we say to them, we'll wait till after the election and we make a decision. Mm. Our partners who want to put funds in, it's the same thing. Let's see what happens. We don't think anything 
It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there might be a change of direction, mm -hmm. change in policy, mm -hmm. this and that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't help anyone. Is it the same in uh, you know, advanced economies, like the UK, for instance, where you've worked and lived for many yeah. years? Yeah. It is to an extent, but not to the extent that we do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a policy thing because you have labor who have their policies set out, you have the conservatives who have their policies, Republicans and that, right? So business people actually pitch. They, they, they eat, look at which party favors uh, uh, their thoughts and their policies and that. And that's how we pick mm. parties. And I believe I do see, mm. right? I look at, not as a... a, a a diehard supporter of any political party. Not a diehard supporter. Mm. And I think diasporans tend mm. not to be. Mm. And the reason why diasporans tend not to be mm. diehard, mm. I've met so many MPP people, mm. NDC people mm. sitting in the UK, where you go to the UK on the airwaves, mm. they criticize. MPP people criticize the government. NDC people criticize. And why? Because they are removed from the... The, the, the patronage thing. Mm, mm, they don't mm, earn anything from mm, here, whether it's mm, MPP. Mm, mm, Ghana runs supreme for mm, them. Mm, in the UK, it's the same. Mm, whether it's Labour or Conservative, it's a policy thing. Mm, I believe Labour will be good for my, mm, uh, my company mm, or Conservatives will be good for my company. Mm, but they don't fit me. You think that's a level we should be going to? We should be getting mm, to that so mm, that when you support a party mm, or you put funds into a party, you put it in because they are aligned. Mm, they are getting... They are actually going to implement policies mm. that endure to the benefit mm. or, or align with your thoughts. Mm. Not because maybe you get some contract here and you no. get some contract there and do this and that. And yes. So that is uh, where we shy off a little bit, right. getting close to an election. Mm. And, and then we have to come back and go through mm. that. And the political cycle here never ends. I'd like to wrap up on the issue of legacy and watch mm you'd want to be remembered for. And of course, we can touch a bit on the succession mm -hmm. planning and, 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 and what programs or mm -hmm. structures you have put in place mm -hmm. to ensure that there's sustainability mm -hmm. you know, in this business that you've created. That has been probably one of the biggest things that I learned in my period in my host country and traveling around the world. And it is my vision to do the same thing and also bring like-minded people on board. Uh, what is it? Ghana is full of only one generation businesses. One. I don't think I can name 10 or 15 or let's say 20 businesses that have outlived their owners two or three generations. Mm. That is the problem we face. Because I would start KGL to take it to a level. It should not all, all the stakeholders, and when I mean by stakeholders, I'm also one that doesn't believe in shareholders. I believe in stakeholders. The stakeholders are yourselves, the media are coming in here. The stakeholders are GRE. The stakeholders are the government. They should ensure that KGL outlives me. They should also ensure I don't destroy it. Because they are, I have got staff here who will probably work here their entire lives. I've got the GRA who will probably pick up taxes here for the time that I lived. I've got the government. So there are so many, the media, we spend a lot on the media and that. They should ensure that this company survives. It is not an Alex Daddy company. Yes, he's the major shareholder. He sits down there, he makes some money. Yeah. But he's used the blood and sweat of others. So why should we let him fold the company and just move on? It's a company that the government, all stakeholders, should be interested. If he's fed up on going, okay, let him go. We'll probably find a way of passing it on to others. Because it's something that has been created, mm. not by only him. It's his vision. Mm. So that's the first thing about that. So that takes us to what do we do? We have to make sure this goes generation to generation to generation. It's passed on. If I raise it to let's say we, we go in the next 500 years, right? 10 levels. If I took it to level three, the next generation should take it to level five. Another generation to level seven. Until we get there, my children don't necessarily have to run the company. The corporate governance structure has to be there. The managers of the company, it has to be structured so that 
three, four, five hundred years. It goes on. That is what I want to be remembered for. Also with the foundation, we want to set up legacy funds. We don't want to, we don't want to um, set up projects and invest in projects like we're talking about the health facility in, in uh, Ashanti region. When, I'm, when I pass away, it's not looked after. I want to also showcase what we can do in that space, right? Set up legacy funds aside your estate so that these things carry on. There are a lot of legacy funds that come in to help us here. Uh, projects, whether it's MasterCard fund, whether it's uh, maybe some of these banks with funds and that. They are legacy funds. So it's money that's not touched. I've, I've done quite a few projects in my own school in Fanspim. I've, I've set up uh, we, 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 we doing the sports facility and that. Do I want it to deteriorate because I've passed on? The answer is no. I don't want that. So I want a separate fund, right, that will take care of all these projects that we're doing, right, the maintenance culture of it and all that. So uh, we pray that God will help us do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexei. I really appreciate your time on the program. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. It's been good. It's been good Thank having you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Right, that was uh, Mr. Alex uh, Dade. He is the founder and group chairman of the KGL. Uh, he's been our guest on Business Focus tonight. My name is Parker Siasari. Uh, the program has been live on TV3, live on our Facebook channel, also on DSTV channel 279, and also live on YouTube. Of course, you can get the full program there and watch time and again and again. My name is Parkus Yassari. Uh, we'll say bye-bye for now. Uh, God willing, same time next week, we'll come your way with yet another exciting edition of Business Focus. Bye-bye.